Good afternoon. The Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies. Uh, welcome everybody. Today we have the Graduate Student Symposium. Five graduate students at Brown University are going to present their, their research uh, by turns. <laughs> uh, our first uh, presenter is Matt Balance. <clears throat> His first year PhD student in the Department of Anthropology. His research is based on in Andean South America, where he examines late prehistoric and colonial road systems. He has a Bachelor in Archaeology and History from the University of North Carolina and a Master in Anthropology from Colorado State University. Welcome, Matt. Hey, uh, thanks everybody for coming. I'm Matt, this is my presentation. We only have a short time, so I wanna to try to get it going. Um, so my guiding question in this research is, how did the experience of movement, and as I'm going to focus on particularly today, the experience of movements between moments of rest, uh, contribute to the development of inequality in the colonial Andes? I put this picture up here and, and a few dates here just to sort of highlight the fact that I'm not talking about conquest. This is several hundred years later. This is not Habsburg, sort of moment of contact, figuring... This colonialism has been happening for a while. We're in the sort of white powdered wig era of colonialism. And uh, one of the things that happens around that time is, is a lot of reform and reorganization and the creation of this thing called the POSTA system that I'm particularly interested in. So the POSTA system, as the name might imply, is a, a series of postal stations. You might think about the, sort of the Pony Express as a, a US uh, comparison you could make. Um, but it's also an officially planned sequence of inns operated by private individuals, exactly how they get sort of planning permission changes over the colonial period. Um, if we look at 18th century definitions, you see this word is used widely. It is associated with the mail, but there's lots of other things. It's, it's the horses that are stationed for people there. Um, it's, it's the sites, and it's particularly, again, as I'm going to focus on today, the distances between them. Um, again, just so you know, I'm not cherry picking. There's another one. Um, the source that I base this on is a, a work of satire, a sort of partly fictional account of moving along this road system between Buenos Aires and Lima in the 18th century called El Lazarillo de Ciegos Caminantes. Um, importantly, one of the things we get out of this document, among lots of other things, are, is this distinction between two classes of traveler, the sort of educated merchant with access to capital and market knowledge, and the, uh, I didn't put a highlight on this slide, but the quote, quote unquote common muleteer, the sort of everyday labor of moving goods. Um, the other thing we get out of this document is lots and lots of place names. And so my sort of primary method for engaging with this document was to retrace the route and, and plot it in space um, using both um, distance tables composed as part of a translation, um, as well as uh, some modern toponyms and some georeferenced historic maps. Um, I really wanted to sort of situate the text on the ground, as it were. Um, for any GIS nerds in here, I uh, did that using Tobler's hiking function and a tool called distance accumulation, um, which uh, is not very important for the purpose of this, but I, I throw it in here if anybody cares. Um, the results are not very interesting. <laughs> um, right up until you notice that there's a little bit of a, of a seeming divide on either side of Potosi. Potosi, for context, um, a hugely important silver mine, one of the world's largest sources of silver for several hundred years, hugely important to the Spanish uh, crown and their treasury. Um, and so that sort of got me interested in investigating this a little further. If you take a day's journey, um, you have, oh, I'm cut off a little bit here, but between 50 and 60 samples of day's journeys on either side of Potosi, um, you can see that they sort of fall into two groups. On the east side heading down to Buenos Aires, lots of distance between them, lots of variability as well. This isn't a very regular 
uh, days travel uh, versus the other side more regular, more predictable, and, and shorter days as well. Um, that the absolute values change, obviously, if you're riding a horse, for example, you might be moving faster or a mule versus walking, but the relative um, values are, the, the pattern remains. Um, and I, what I argue that this corresponds to and, and why I think this is interesting is on one side you have a well-traveled route that's um, people use throughout the colonial period, uh, people that's also built uh, on top of Inca infrastructure in a lot of cases, versus looking to the east side of Potosí, it could also be to the south, what you see is a route that really only um, becomes regular with the rise of the Cordoba mule trade in the 18th century. So uh, sort of a red is a route that I'm associating with that earlier episode, uh, that earlier period of colonial history. This, this uh, blue route section down here is really sort of an 18th century development. Um, I'm an archeologist. So I have to put some archeology span in here. Um, as you can see by the vastness of the South American continent and the relative lack of red dots, there's not a lot of great archeology span to draw from, but there are a few. Um, and so for that reason, I'm actually gonna move off of the road that I just showed you up to one of its northern trunks near uh, what would be the modern city of Trujillo in Peru to look at the site of Pajatambo. This sort of corresponds quite well with what we see in the text in terms of what a posta is supposed to be. There's facilities for travelers, there's a kitchen, there's space for stabling animals, there's space for storing your trade goods. Um, there's also these coins, which were found as part of an excavation in the 1980s, uh, were all found in the central plaza. So we think we see a central plaza that's associated with paying wages um, and sort of organizing, getting ready for a day's travel. If we go back to the text, um, that appears in the text as well. The bolded part here, you can see the first period of the day. Um, the author here using mitayo, so sort of pointing to the mita and earlier forms of conscripted labor. Um, but in this case, they're being paid a, at least a nominal wage. Um, versus, so, th so that's what a, a sort of prototypical posta looks like that lines up with what the text says a post is supposed to be and what a post is supposed to be used for. But if we look at other roads, um, this is one of the trunks that sort of uh, trunk roads that connects that main line, the red, uh, from one of the earlier images to the Pacific coast. What you see are a lot more things like this. This is a Pascana. It's sort of an ephemeral windbreak. It's a campsite. It's not a lot of formal architectural investment. And these have been used by um, indigenous herders, traders, uh, llama caravans going back uh, at least several centuries in the Andes. They're widespread by the late intermediate period, um, which is sort of 1200, 1400-ish in Andean archaeology. What becomes really interesting is that you don't see a lot of mentions of these in the text, um, I would argue because the author, uh, this elite mercantile you know, capitalist Spaniard didn't see them. But you do see evidence of these sort of common muleteers, to bring us back to the original quote, staying outside of the posta, right? And, and sort of building their own systems of movement and rest. Um, this is a, uh, an account of the town of Aurora, where there was supposedly a corrupt postmaster. And what's really interesting is, according to the author again of Alezario de Ciegos Caminantes, is that the common muleteers stopped going into town when they knew that that guy was going to try to extort money from them. They stop before town, they stop after town, and assumedly, they try to engage as little as possible with the posta system that has become so uh, extractive and, and to a certain audience corrupt, depending on your sort of place in the colonial hierarchy. So it brings me um, to some sorts of conclusions. Obviously, this is still a work in progress, but one of the things that I think we see is a difference between an older Western sort of Habsburg and Inca route and an 18th century one. And, it, and that, that is one of distance and of, of predictability of a day's rest. And I think what you're seeing is the stretching out of labor uh, and, and the lengthening of a day's travel. <coughs> the, the little archeological evidence that we have and an engagement with the text seems to suggest that the way that they're sort of coercing people into spreading a day's travel out is through wage labor, right? So a transformation from these earlier colonial co sort of directly coerced forms of labor, um, something that needs to be investigated further as to exactly how 
and where wage labor takes off in Indian South America, but some interesting possibilities. Um, and then, but lastly, if you, what archaeology really brings and bringing archaeology back to the text highlights is a, the, continue, the continuation of agency, of uh, choice, and often a rely, doing that through a reliance on indigenous pastoral traditions. Um, so with that, thanks. Thank you, Matt. Now is the turn of Morgan Clark. Um, she's a fourth year PhD candidate studying Maya archaeology in the Department of Anthropology. Along with anthropology, her undergraduate degrees are in linguistics and English literature. Her dissertation focuses on the language and writing of classic period Maya. Welcome, Morgan. Just to be clear, I won't be talking about my dissertation. <laughs> um, this is an excavation that I've been involved in the past couple of summers. Um, so today I'll present the final results and interpretations of data collected from La Cuernavilla's water reservoir, or Aguada, and its talud tablero structure. These features are not directly related to each other as they are located in different complexes within the site. However, they give key perspectives on the site's use, occupation, and function. La Cuernavilla, named after the Hornburg, the famed fictional fortress, is the largest defensive complex known in Mesoamerica. It safely straddles a hilltop in the north part of the Buena Vista Valley, and entrance to the site was once controlled by an extensive defensive system that included ramparts, ditches, and walls as high as two meters. It was identified in LIDAR imagery in 2016, surveyed in 2018, and excavated in 2021 and 2022. The Iguala I'll be discussing is positioned at the western edge of the west complex. It sits at the top of a drainage basin, meaning it can easily collect a lot of water. It interests us because we can use it to think about how many people the site could have sustained. A question we could ask is, how much water does a fortress need, and for how many people? The Talu Tablero, nicknamed as such for its distinctive central Mexican Teotihuacan style facade, overlooks the palace group in the east complex. The identification of this structure during ground survey suggested the possibility that La Cuernavilla was constructed following the Teotihuacan invasion of nearby Tikal in the fourth century, but we know now that isn't true. The site is actually several centuries older. So let's talk about the Iguala. Here's a closer look at it with some profiles showing depths from the north, south, and east, west transects. The Iguala's dam to the south is visib visible in the LIDAR plan view and in the north-south profile. Drawings of the two excavations in this operation are included in the north-south profile as well. One excavation was in the back slope, the other was on top of the dam. The dashed lines show the extrapolated dimensions of the Iguada based on the slope of the Iguada's floor and where bedrock was encountered. Project colleagues of mine collected data on the magnetic susceptibility and elemental composition of soil samples from within the excavations. And I don't want to get too into the weeds with these, so I would, I would be happy to answer more questions about them later if people have them. But the takeaway here is that the magnetic, magnetic susceptibility um, can tell us things like alloctonous elements like iron, silicon, and aluminum are proxies for stability, and that helps us make certain interpretation, interpretations about construction and water quality. For instance, we know that the Iguata floor is a buried soil. It is made from decomposed limestone that was brought from elsewhere. And we know that they were keeping the Iguata clean somehow because deposition is so low during the time that it was used. With the dam, we see that the dark portion is also a buried soil. It's actually a clay that was harvested from the Bajo and packed here. Um, a Bajo is a seasonal swamp that fills during the rainy season, by the way. 
Uh, so decomposed limestone was packed onto these distinct layers on top, forming a hard cap. This is also decomposed limestone. It's called Saskab, it, and it, pro it probably lined the entire Aguada. This would have helped with water retention and would have helped to prevent contamination from impurities rising up from, from the groundwater. Dates for the Aguada and Dam are based on ceramic chronology and radiocarbon. What we see is that these features were constructed in the late pre-classic and used into the early classic, and I'll talk more about why that matters in a minute. I modeled the Aguada's watershed using the basic hydrological tool set on ArcGIS Pro. The watershed has an area of 9,254 square meters. We can determine how much water would have been funneled into the Aguada by multiplying this area by rainfall depth, which here is based on the 2020 rainfall data for Flores Paten in Guatemala. That number was 1,334 millimeters. When multiplied by the watershed area, we get 12,344,836 liters. That's about three times more than the Aguada's estimated capacity of 3,640,000 liters, meaning that the Aguada could reach capacity and then be depleted more than three times in a year. The only thing is that we need to account for water loss by evaporation, so really, only about half of the water in the Aguada is actually getting consumed by people. If we account for evaporation and how much rain is falling when, we can actually say that the Aguada was replenishing enough water throughout the year to get close to that original 3,640,000 liter estimate. That would support 2,000 to 5,000 people. And that's a substantial number that seems to indicate a population much greater than La Cuernavilla's structure count suggests. The superfluity of water might suggest that there was, in fact, a larger population than structure count suggests, that there may have been a temporary population residing in perishable structures, or at the very least, a larger population may have been planned for. The important thing here is that water provisioning at this time apparently had little to do with defensive reasons. The Aguada was built centuries before the Teotihuacanos invaded, and as it turns out, the defensive features in the site date to the early classic. What this tells us is that pe the people who first settled here were not really using this as a fortress. That happened later. But initial planning still clearly had a substantial population in mind. The project colleagues and I think that this population was probably relocating from El Palmar, a site to the south that was failing at around this time. Let's move on to the Talud Tablero. The Talud Tablero is a structure that was built much later than this first influx of planning and settlement from El Palmar, clearly after Teotihuacan's invasion of Tikal, which is only a four hour walk away. A strong possibility is that La Cuernavilla was occupied after Teotihuacan ambassadors replaced T Tikal's existing dynasty with their own, something that we know from local inscriptions. The idea is that La Cuernavilla may have been used to continue securing Teotihuacan Teotihuacano control over Tikal. In 2021 and 2022, several excavations were opened in and around the Talu Tablero structure. These were intended to probe the general form of the structure. One of the most important excavations was a trench opened on the front facade where well-preserved steps and a single talud were uncovered. A cached bowl was discovered just north of the initial steps. The bowl was capped with a round stone buried under construction fill and then plastered over. Whatever the bowl contained has since decomposed, but some kind of organic material is likely. Based on the light brown color of the soil in the bowl, the contents probably consisted of offerings of food, which is typical of dedicatory caches in ancient Maya buildings. Dedicatory caches are referred to as such because they are understood to have, been, to have been elements of dedication rituals, which sanctified spaces prior to their usage. Since dedicatory caches are placed within buildings just before construction is completed, they make excellent chronological markers for when structures were first built. As such, we can now infer, based on the ceramic type and variety of this bowl, that the Talud Tablero structure was built around the sixth century. The other critical excavation was on top of the structure. The drawing shows its projected shape based on this excavation and what was already exposed from looters trenches. Basically, it's a small structure with two, two narrow chambers. Here's a profile of those excavations. The pit in the southernmost room terminated once we reached a looter's trench that extended beneath the building. The thing to note here is that we found late classic ceramics right before the entrance to the building, and right inside the building on the surface of Piso Uno, we found lots of ash. Radiocarbon from this ash dates to 1100 to 1200 CE. 
This date and the date associated with the late classic ceramic deposit suggests that this structure was a site of ritual activity long after the site's abandonment in the early classic. The chronology of the Iguata is mostly consistent with the usage of the site overall, with initial construction beginning in the late pre-classic and abandonment taking place during the early classic. Construction appears to have occurred during a single phase with no later modifications. We can therefore conclude that the Iguata's massive water supply was not enhanced later during La Cuernavilla's occupation, but that this supply was integral to its planning from the very start, centuries earlier than the arrival of Teotihuacanos. It is only after their arrival to the region that the site's fortifications and distinctive talud tablero structure were erected, as carbon analyses show. Because of the structure's aesthetic affiliation with Teotihuacan, colleagues and I imagine that whoever used the site at this time was affiliated with, with Tikal. The original occupants, who likely came from nearby El Palmar, either left or pledged their allegiance. Then, for whatever reason, the site fell out of use, living on in the memories of others nearby who at times made their pilgrimages there. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Thanks, Morgan. Now is the term of Augusta Guta da Silveira de Oliveira. She's a PhD student at the University at the History Department at Brown University. Her work examines the role of lesbian activism within the emerging homosexual press in Brazil during the country's dictatorship period from 1964 to 1985. She holds both a master and bachelor in history from Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul in Brazil. Uh, she's a Fulbright Capes Fellow, and um, she's currently working on her doctoral dissertation on lesbian life in 20th century Brazil. She's a founding member of the Brazilian Lesbian Archival. Welcome, Guta. Hi everyone, thanks for being here and thanks uh, to CLACS for organizing the symposium and supporting my research. It's great to hear uh, more about research being done in Latin America here at Brown. Um, so I'm a third year PhD student, hopefully candidate soon. Um, and my presentation for today is titled Between Authoritarianism and Misogyny, Lesbian Activism and the Brazilian Homosexual Press During the Military Dictatorship. So my dissertation is geared more towards a broader social history of lesbian life in Brazil, but what this paper does is examine the role of lesbian activism and its relationship with the emerging homosexual press during the dictatorship, which spanned from 1964 to 1985. I argue that lesbian independent activism emerged as a response to misogyny within the homosexual movement and also the homosexual press. I use homosexual as to keep up with the terminology used at the time when the movement was very critical of anglicized terms such as gay. Um, I have very few slides, not a lot of archaeology. Um, so uh, by the late 1970s, a liberal political climate enabled the organization of civil society, including unions, the student and the feminist movements, despite the, the dictatorship's repressive efforts. Uh, this was the context in which the politically engaged homosexual movement emerged, alongside an alternative homosexual press, contributing to debate on rights, visibility, and new ideas, such as coming out publicly, as well as being informed as well as what the movement was doing here in the U.S. The first politicized homosexual paper, the monthly Lampion da Esquina, was founded in 1978. Later, Somos was founded in Sao Paulo. It was the first politicized homosexual group in Brazil. Lesbians were part of Somos, but were absent from Lampion's editorial board, and consequently had little representation in the paper's stories. 
It was only when called to action that the women from Somos took the lead to write the cover stories from, for Lampion's 12th edition in May of 79, which you see uh, there in the left, the top left, uh, directly then connecting lesbian activism and the alternative press. So in that edition, uh, they recounted the trajectory of lesbian activism, and it's mentioned that this cover story, written by the women of Somos, actually inaugurated the lesbian movement in Brazil. The cover story focused then on how late lesbians were to the conversation on homosexuality, attributing that to the authoritarian repression of the dictatorship and also to other uh, dynamics from the, the lesbian movement. But it recounted life stories and how they came to terms with their own sexuality and uh, future projects for the movement. And after this, a lesbian feminist group was created within Somos and later separating from the group in 1980 due to the misogyny and the failure to propose a feminist debate within the organization. And they created the lesbian feminist action group called GAUF. This is also the case for Lampion and the homosexual press. After the cover story in 1979, some women joined the editorial board and more women contributors covered stories on feminism and the women's movement. But Lampion was composed mainly of cisgender men, though lesbians were part of the paper's moderate readership. In addition, over time, some members of Lampion's editorial board became increasingly critical of social movements and their political demands, opposing what they saw as leftist co-optation. The fact that most women who contributed to the periodical were also involved with homosexual and lesbian politicized groups like Somos and other feminist organizations kept them away from further contributing in Lampion, hence trying to step out of the conflict between the homosexual and the feminist movement. Lampion ran almost for 40 editions and ended in 1981. The, the part that of women from Somos and the hardships of finding a vehicle for communication with other lesbians could have been the demise of the newfound lesbian movement. But lesbians were determined to create space for their demands. They continued to align themselves with homosexual groups in the common struggle against the dictatorship, participating on marches, as you see in the pictures, um, and supporting common demands mostly related to repression and police violence. They got closer to the feminist movement, though feminists were also hesitant to welcome them due to the fear of being perceived as lesbians and having their demands discredited by the left. The way out between authoritarian repression and lack of space within the homosexual press was to invest in their own communication efforts. And I argue that communication is key because Brazil is a country of continental size and there, there were lesbians seeking to connect in all parts of the country but unable to do so. If Lampion's criticism of social movements and lack of, lef lack of lesbian representation make things harder at first, the experience that lesbians had in 79 as writers of the cover story on lesbian life enabled them to envision what their own co publication could do for the movement. In the fashion of other countercultural and alternative publications, the Lesbian Feminist Action Group, GAUF, issued in 81 a single edition of a tabloid newspaper, Shana Kun Shana, which in English roughly translates to Pussy with Pussy. The newspaper echoed Lampion's uh, format, but high costs made the printing process and distribution very difficult. Only a year later, the group managed to issue semestral editions of a bulletin of the same name, which ran until 1987, materializing the community they envisioned, but could never achieve while depending on vehicles such as Lampion. Shana Conchana's contents included manifestos in favor of democratization, book recommendations, latest news of the lesbian movement in Brazil and around the world, and the basis of a lesbian feminist perspective that set the tone of the periodical. Other bulletins, though less successful, also emerged in the period. The lesbian press followed its goal of connecting women and communicating a new politicized lesbian identity, promoting articulation and the formation of networks through letters and meetings, something that was unthinkable in the context of the predominantly male homosexual press. And here you see a, a couple of covers from Shana Kum Shana, and below is uh, activist uh, Roseli Hoch, uh, there was a member of Gaufi, but and also edited Shana Kun Shana. Lesbians uh, were organized against the dictatorship, but they suffered backlash in many fronts. The partisan left, 
which was didn't accept homosexuality, the homosexual movement, which was misogynistic, and the feminist movement that didn't want to be perceived as lesbian. In addition, repression in urban areas also sought to police the lesbian bar scene as part of the dictatorship's ideology based on morality and social order. Lesbian activism highlighted the specificities of the repression suffered by women who did not conform to ideals of femininity, and that was only possible with the emergence of a spe specialized lesbian press, separate from the homosexual press that was first prevalent. In 1983, Lesbians were forbidden to sell the bulletin Shana Kun Shana at Ferros Bar, which you see in the pictures, um, in Sao Paulo, and banned from the establishment. Ferros Bar was a place of lesbian socialization in Sao Paulo, and uh, among others, it was very important because lesbians used to meet there, and Shana Kun Shana was distributed. So after being expelled, they later returned, organizing a, pro a protest and reclaiming the space, arguing in favor of democratic liberties. They were admitted and resumed selling Shana Kum Shana there. And due to the nature of this demonstration, the event has been referenced as the Brazilian Stonewall. So, in conclusion, my research offers new insights into the interplay uh, between gender, sexuality, and politics in the last stretch of the authoritarian period in Brazil. By looking at the intersection between the lesbian movement and the homosexual press, I point to the role of Lampião da Esquina in fomenting the emergence of a lesbian press in Brazil. Lesbians hardly got the space they deserved throughout Lampião's run, but a wide lesbian readership looked to Lampião either to support it or to criticize it. The fact that other exclusively lesbian periodicals and bulletins appeared also highlights Lampião's inability to speak directly to a lesbian audience. Women were in addition to Lampion's stories, not part of it. Through their intermittent participation and the acknowledgement that they needed to create exclusive spaces, lesbians articulated the networks that carried the movement throughout the 80s and which brought them out of isolation, enabling the emergence of a visible lesbian community. Thank you. Thank you, Guta. Now is the turn of uh, Mateo Diaz Chosa. He's a PhD candidate in Hispanic Studies at Brown University. Um, he's currently an interdisciplinary opportunity fellow at the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies. He has a bachelor in literature from Uni Universidad Nacional Mayor de San Marcos. His research focuses on 20th century and contemporary Latin American literature, global 60s studies, and the relationship between politics, memory, and writing in Latin America. Welcome, Mateo. Hi all, thank you so much for being here. Thank you to Clax for organizing this event. I will basically talk, uh, this is part of a, a broader project, which is my dissertation about uh, self-sacrifice in Latin America. On September 11th, 1973, Chilean President Salvador Allende delivered his last speech while the presidential palace was being bombed during a military coup d'etat. Allende had been elected in 1970, leading the Unidad Popular Front, a left-wing coalition that included socialists, communists, and progressive Christians. His administration had attracted international attention as the first democratically elected socialist government, a unique case that diverged from previous armed seizures of power, such as the Bolshevik and Cuban revolutions. In 1973, this political experiment abruptly came to an end when the Chilean army, supported by the CIA, started an uprising in Valparaíso, 72 miles west of Santiago. The revolt will soon escalate until the bombing of the presidential palace and the death of President Allende brought Augusto Pinochet to power. That day, Allende delivered five radio messages, the last of which has become one of the most famous moments in Latin American political history. 
In this short presentation, I will address how Allende's last speech epitomizes an ethics of self-sacrifice widespread during the 60s and 70s in Latin America. In particular, I will pay attention to the ways in which Allende's physical voice becomes his legacy and frames his sacrifice as the seed that it would eventually reverse the conservative turn that brought Pinochet to power. Self-sacrifice consists of putting life at risk or even giving it up in order to transmit a political message and fulfill a duty to a collective, be it the nation, a religion, or, as in Allende's case, a political group. As K.M. Fjord argues, political self-sacrifice challenges the assumption that individual survival is the ultimate rational end as it shifts the focus away from oneself to the social space. And she says, sacrifice points to something outside the self, insofar as one cannot meaningfully sacrifice the self for the self's own sake, but only for others. In his last speech, Allende addresses the Chilean people announcing that he will neither resign nor surrender, but pay with his life the people's loyalty. He also tells them that the army has already bombed two radio stations, Radio Portales and Radio Corporación, and will soon bomb Radio Magallanes, the one which is broadcasting his speech live. Thus Allende announces that this will probably be his final message to the nation. The frail and dramatic communicative situation is illustrated by the sound of voices on airplanes while Allende speaks. And I have a short excerpt here. But I don't know if... Is it working, the audio? No, well, we will have to Google it. <laughs> Paradoxically, Allende had stated in a 1971 speech delivered at the end of Fidel Castro's visit to Chile that he didn't want to become a martyr. His statement needs to be put in perspective. The revolutionaries from Cuba believed that guerrilla warfare was the only way to conquer power and transform society. While Fidel encouraged young leftists from Latin America to imitate Che Guevara and die while pursuing revolutionary struggle, Allende believed in institutional ways to achieve social transformation. In the end, he was a professional politician. He had been the Chilean government secretary of health during the 1930s, and he had run for president three times before getting elected. Nevertheless, his last speech seems to contradict his previous declarations and illustrates a different aspect of Allende's political understanding. The anti-democratic and violent opposition he faced during the last years of his government, which reached its climax in the September 11th Santiago bombing, must have convinced him that institutional means would not keep his administration in power. Caught, as he said, in a historic transition, Allende's last speech announces the imminence of his death and frames it as a self-sacrifice. He says, these are my last words and I am certain that my sacrifice won't be in vain. More strikingly, Allende mentions the word sacrifice at one other point in the speech, but gives it a negative balance. The people should defend themselves, but not sacrifice themselves. Why is, why is it accept acceptable for him to sacrifice himself, but not for the people? According to Fürke, self-sacrifice is a performative act that seeks to communicate a message to the audience. In Allende's case, he explicitly states at the end of his speech that his sacrifice offers a moral lesson to punish felony, cowardice, and treason. More importantly, Allende wants his last words to transmit a message of hope condensed in the most famous passage of the speech, which is here, and says, Go forward knowing that sooner rather than later, the great avenues will open again and free men will walk through them to construct a better society. Those great avenues, Alamedas in Spanish, are an allusion to one of the larger avenues in Santiago, the Alameda Avenue, where crowds of people used to march in support of his government. His message promises that sooner than later, the political shift of the coup will be reversed. Allende's view of sacrifice is deeply related to his refusal to engage in armed struggle and his faith in institutional regulation. Even when cases of terrorist attacks and military insubordination became frequent at the end of his government, 
Allende never agreed to arm his constituency to fight a possible insurrection as many, including the Cubans, suggested. It was only during the September 11th coup when it became crystal clear that the opposition would depose him using the tactics of war instead of politics that Allende started to speak the language of sacrifice. His speech, however, is not a call for rebellion or an allegation of disobedience. In order to avoid bloodshed, Allende does not encourage his supporters to openly fight the army. What he does instead is create a legacy in which the Unidad Popular project, his figure, and his voice merge together as a memory of resistance. In a Christ-like annunciation of his own death, Allende claims, surely Radio Magallanes will be silenced and the calm metal instrument of my voice will no longer reach you. It does not matter, you will continue hearing it, it I will always be next to you. This calm metal voice, a quasi-oxymoronic phrase that contains Allende's main contradiction, his calm acceptance of institutions, and his firm commitment for social transformation, is represented in the speech as a material legacy that will survive him. That is also the message that his, that his sacrifice, which would become real just hours after the speech, is intended to communicate to the audience. Was Allende's prediction right? Was his sacrifice successful in creating a legacy, or to put it another way, have the great avenues being open again? Those questions are certainly hard to answer because political history has a long scope. On the one hand, it is undeniable that Allende's legacy, symbolized by his last speech, has been preserved for certain sectors of Chilean society. For instance, it has been memorialized in the state-directed Museo de la Memoria, this one, as well as in numerous films and songs. For example, Salvador Allende is a film by Patricio Guzmán, the famous <coughs> Chilean filmmaker. Today, his last words are invoked worldwide to denounce not just the, uh, the atrocities of the Pinochet regime, but also the pernicious effects of United States interventionism. On the other hand, the conflict at the center of Chilean politics is still unresolved. The enthusiasm that accompanied the election of Gabriel Boric, who evoked Allende when assuming the presidency, coincides with the disappointment of the rejected new constitution that still leaves Pinochet's constitution as the legal framework of the country. In addition, other struggles, feminism, the Mapuche conflict, the fight for the right of for education and healthcare, the impact of migration, have gained prominence and created a more complex panorama than in the 70s. Paradoxically, in a time when revolutionary discourse on the ethics of sacrifice is less common in politics, Allende's institutional trajectory seems to make him a modern figure. But would he be remembered in the same way today if he hadn't uttered his last speech and ended the way he did? Thank you. Thank you, Mateo. Um, now is the term of Alexandria Miller. She's PhD candidate in the Department of Africana Studies. She studies black post-colonial cultures and social movements, Caribbean feminism, intellectual and cultural histories, and black women's entrepreneurship. Alexandra is also the founder and host of the podcast Strictly Facts, a guide to Caribbean history and culture. Her research focuses on the role of women as performers and entrepreneurs in the development and promotion of reggae. She's coming online. Welcome, Alexandria. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, and good afternoon. Um, I hope this all tech stuff goes well. Um, special thank you to CLACS for organizing, um, especially Dr. Lewis and Kate Goldman for organizing, but as well as for your support. Um, and mentorship over the last few years as a now fourth year, which seems daunting in a sense. Um, let me share my screen. Ready? Oops. 
hope that's working for everyone. Um, and so yes, uh, before um, jumping into my talk, I've been, I hope it's working. Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, before jumping into my talk, I have a brief video that I'll just play for a few moments. Over the years, um, like I said, the past 20 odd years, I've been in the music industry. And I want to give thanks to Bridget Anderson and Judah Maud for this achievement. Because with the office experience, she wanted me to run the office business and she realized this is it. But then I'm learning about artists and stage shows. And this is something new, even though my brother Fred Lux is an artist, this is something new. And I said, you know, I like this. People start employing me to work backstage on their shows. I was just all over. I, it was just a great experience. After working with um, with with Christine Hewitt and you know getting to know the artist more and more, she recommended me to Tony Rebel. I worked with him for ten years on Rebel Salute backstage, and um, I've been working on different shows um, like Miss Kemp, which let me come from five six years now. I worked at. Um, Western consciousness for about four years backstage as well in stage management. But then I wanted to do something for myself. And so I went into um, taking flyers and looking at them, not going to the events. And I said, you know, these events look very nice. You know, I'm going to tell my friends about it. I'm not fussy, but I'm going to tell them about it. And I kept contacting my friends through text you know, SMS and telling them about these events. They were so happy and I keep promoting. But then I have what you call a ja daughter, not god daughter, ja daughter. And she come to me and say, Mama, all these promotion you're doing, are you getting paid? I said, no. She said, but it takes credit, it takes time. Every time I call you, tell me you're busy, you eat already. She was just so concerned about me. Then I went into myself and I said, this is something I love and I would love an earning from it. How can I do it? So I went to one of the inner city dub events, Kirk I Nation, inner city dub, I Nation books. He kept something down by Spanish down road. And he said, um, he saw me with a lot of people and people coming to me and he was writing. So what are you doing? I said, oh, taking down people's name because they want me to invite them to the event. And he said, you do that? I said, yes. And said, all right. You can, so you can take my fly and promote mine. I said, sure. But it's like he and himself, being a business person, knew that this is a business. And he said to me, Aisha, I am going to put something in your hand. And he put something in my hand, a paper money, and he said, run my promotions for me. I want my event to grow. So it's event grow. So people want to know why. They rate me for all that I have been doing. And, you know, I'm not lying to you. Big promoters have been coming to me to promote their events. All of what I have done and what I am doing now, I still don't think I've reached that peak, but I am peaking. It is such a sweet feeling. I love what I do. It's a... I will... Um, there we go. Uh, that's the moral of the, the gist of the video, one of the oral histories I've been collecting. But this presentation today um, is uh, comes from a chapter of my dissertation, which, to put it tersely, is a women's history of reggae music. So as many of you all are familiar, um, the genre in itself is, you know, has extended beyond Jamaica and is a global genre now. But amongst all of the names that some might name um, who are, you know, critical to the history of reggae, women oftentimes do not even show up. And so, in a sense, um, my dissertation is not only just a women's history of reggae, but one that, you know, tremendously is analyzing um, post-colonial gender politics and Caribbean feminisms as well. And so in this video, you heard from Quick Blast media founder, Marcia Elliott, um, who I've spoken with and I've, I've been speaking with several others within um, the reggae industry as well. And so she is currently a growing event promoter in the Kingston, Jamaica reggae scene. Um, and as she mentioned, has had a 20 plus year career in terms of just supporting several artists, um, managers, et cetera, in the industry, and then has now gone on to start her own promotion business, event promotion business within reggae 
um, just based out of her love of the genre. And so my presentation today, as I mentioned, comes from my dissertation um, to inherently focus on entrepreneurship, particularly, it was actually one of the pieces that I was most excited about talking about and um, in developing the ideas for my dissertation. But overall, um, in a sense, has really been keen for me because while some may be able to name people like Coffee, who um, won the 2020 Grammy, first woman ever to win the solo Grammy for reggae. Um, and maybe if you're familiar with the deeper historiography of reggae, you might be able to name uh, Marcia Griffiths, um, Judy Moa, Trisha Marley, a few others. Um, artists tend to have the most public facing role, of course, even though so few people know many of the women critical to that history, but there are also substantially more women on the business side of the industry. And so in my dissertation, I've dubbed them reggae women to encapsulate not just singers, but artist managers, um, stylists, booking, PR people, cultural consultants. There's a variety um, in my research. But in doing that, um, I really prioritized ensuring that not only do their legacies and you know the ways that they shape the genre don't go under recognized um, but in doing so and using oral histories as my main methodology i've prioritized not only them speaking their stories in their own voices um, telling their stories in their own voices but also being able to make these stories widely accessible as i hope to do through my research and undo some of the biases in the historiography, which has tended to be more androcentric or male-centered. And so I deliberately, through this chapter of my dissertation, focus on Black women's entrepreneurship to offer another perspective on Black women's labor and work that is oftentimes less described. And so, you know, historically rather, um, we tend to think of Black women's labor, especially through slavery. Um, there are scholars like Hillary Beckles, Barbara Bush, um, the list could go on, of course, Kavolia Glimp, Jennifer Morgan, um, Sasha Turner, who in their research has pointed to the racialized, gendered, reproductive, and physical labor that Black women have had to do through slavery. I think also more contemporarily um, talking about the undue care work that Black women have had to do and women in general have had to do, but particularly focused on the Caribbean. I also think with Guyanese um, activist and scholar and Dai's work and her work with Red Thread in terms of this undue care work. And then also other scholars like Gina Ulissi, um, Kamala Kempadu, Winifred Brown Glaude, who in one sense or the other are talking about Caribbean women's work either through their work as informer commercial importers or Higglers as it's most, most commonly known. Um, that's, you know, being crafts people, market vendors, et cetera but also in terms of sex work. And so through my research um, and this pers perspective on entrepreneurship, I'm offering a new and novel trifold argument um, about women's innovation through this market, which one decentralizes male authority in the growth of the Jamaican popular culture, two takes into account the new possibilities for this digital age, especially with technological advances and such, therefore, and three, um, espouses some parallels about Black women's work and entrepreneurship and influence in popular culture, particularly as it pertains to the global South and the global North. And so in essence, I argue that Jamaican women's business acumen and intellectual prowess in reggae um, have not only made the music what it is today, but also through entrepreneurship mirrors what we see um, in the so-called developed world. And I'm thinking here, particularly um, over the last decade or so, the major claims about Black women being one of the most dominant groups of growing entrepreneurs in the U.S. and how, in a sense, I think this also parallels in the same way. And so with this comparison in mind, I contend that Black women's tremendous influences um, and popular culture extend beyond, you know, maybe social media trends, that they're not these haphazard or one-off things. They are very intentional, um, cleverly even devised knowledge and networks in which they've been able to 
transform businesses and influence markets and what is popular in popular culture. Um, I'm also thinking here through, as um, Ms. Elliott said, there are a mass of networks. So she named several women who have been clear in her um, growth as an entrepreneur. And a lot of those have been other women who I've spoken with and who have been instrumental in this market. And so when we are taking into account what entrepreneurship looks like in what is termed Jamaica's creative and cultural industries for women in a sense, um, as I've been exploring, it's also very much through the networks of mentorship and sisterhood as well. And so um, as the discussion of cultural and creative industries continues to grow in Jamaica, especially as a major push from the Jamaican government, um, with especially reggae being one of Jamaica's greatest exports, in a sense, even amassing $35 million, um, contributing over $35 million by some accounts to the national GDP, um, some accounts, you know, in that. So my aim as a re result is to ensure that women um, like Miss Elliott are not only firmly supplanted in this larger history of Jamaica's greatest export, but that there is greater support, networks, funding, and awareness of women's work in um, these nuanced and technologically advancing spaces, such as the music industry. These women have managed to coordinate some of the biggest Caribbean music events, um, manage some of the biggest artists, and yet still go unnamed, and of course, um, due to their gender is not without, has not been without challenges. But nonetheless, I hope that with this awareness through hopefully working closely with the ministry here that's focused on gender, that we can create change in some of these spaces, um, develop and clarify some of the industry's development issues and er potential areas for growth, as well as um, the ways that entrepreneurship can be nuanced in the 21st century and moving forward so that um, the island and, you know, this genre and specifically um, can be better suited for women and to paraphrase Miss Elliott suited um, so that female women in the industry can soar. So that'll be it. And I look forward to talking more in my Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Alexandria. Um, please keep in touch. This is the Q&A moment. Uh, please, uh, graduate researchers, take the main table for this dialogue. <laughs> is there a microphone? for the questions or yes. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Come on, Jose Miguel. Podemos empezar con we can start with a um, comment that came from the Zoom, which is from one of your fellow graduate students, Cecilia, who said she doesn't have a question but wants to thank everyone for sharing their incredible projects. So thank Thanks. you guys and congratulations. Thank you. Um, I thank. Uh, I would also like to echo what the person in the comments just said. It, it's wonderful to see all of these uh, presentations um, and uh, different, very different kinds of research uh, coming coming to fruition. Um, I specifically had a couple of questions for Guta and, and for Matt. Um, uh, for Matt, I was wondering if um, l looking at late 18th century maps of, of these regions, I, I had never seen uh, the, the, that kind of route so clearly identified um, on obviously non-colonial document and it was very helpful just to see it and I just congratulate you on all of the painstaking work that that must have involved. I'm wondering in terms of um, the ways that you might have seen um, indigenous toponyms being employed by the colonial, the colonial era, you know, participants in this road construction process because it seems to me that that's sometimes a, an invisible battle 
that's going on in terms of the memory of the ways in which these roads were used historically and the desire on the part of the, of the, colonial, the colonial government to, um, so I just thought, you know, I'd ask you to, to reflect on that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there, there certainly are lots of indigenous toponyms, I would say. I mean, really, they're the majority, but they've also been, um, they've become such an accepted part of um, just Andean names for places. Like, T.I. Guanaco is one that pops up that gets then becomes Tiwanaku, right? Um, so they, they sort of in some cases through orthographic changes or through mishearings of the person um, making a map, it, it, they sort of become further and further diverse, uh, divorced from their roots, but th they're certainly there. I, I would say the um, clearest contestation that, that you see on this route or that I saw in the text um, is about passing mountain passes as significant places in an, in an indigenous landscape, a place that you stop and make payment um, a, a place that you sort of connect with the landscape versus um, a, a really explicit concern of Spanish and mestizo in some cases um, overseers to keep uh, caravans moving and not to stop and participate in those sort of ceremonies. Um, so, so yes, but both the names of the landscape and also sort of significant points on the landscape become points of contestation. Thank you. Um, and for, for Guta, um, you know, the, the, I think the way that you presented the, um, the sort of the, the, the dilemma of, you know, of the lesbian activists was extremely clear um, and, and, and powerful. Um, I was wondering if that, that history that you're, that you're working so hard to kind of, you know, um, just bring out and to, and to clarify to what extent within lesbian communities Today or in you know or in the, the immediate aftermath of the dictatorship, is that um, are those movements uh, more visible to them than to you know sort of the other either you know feminist uh, male dominant homosexual communities etc. and or to the broader public and how that in it in some ways influences the way that you're thinking about the project as a whole. Thanks. Uh, so I think that that dilemma is still very much present, but uh, it has gotten uh, bigger. Uh, not it, it just the, the dynamic has changed with the emergence of a broader LGBTQ movement. I think that uh, lesbian women uh, and their if, if they have uh, separate groups, they're still uh, negotiating the terms of that visibility within the broader movement. Um, so I think that the way that uh, that reverberates after uh, the 80s is, and the dynamics of the movement also changed with the emergence of uh, HIV AIDS and how those movements organized, uh, I think, from 1985 onwards. Um, so uh, I think other things come uh, into play, which is also th uh, the question of redemocratization. And there are certain uh, key events when I see, uh, and collective demands when I see lesbian groups, uh, gay men's groups, and feminist groups, sort of uh, a coalition uh, to advance uh, collective demands, but I see that uh, dilemma and that conflict very much present because the demands are different uh, and they, they've, gotten, uh, they've gotten more complicated and more multifaceted. So uh, in, in a way, I think that that still reverberates. And what I see in the lesbian communities is a lot of women are not necessarily involved in social movements, so they see those dynamics as sort of... Uh, tangential or marginal to their own day-to-day -day experience, while others are very much politicized and see those dynamics in their daily lives and the way that they organize their communities and their political activity. So uh, in my project, it's a, it's a, it's a trying to balance uh, women who were involved in the lesbian movement who were not that many women, and also how uh, 
lesbian social life and those dynamics sort of unfolded parallel and informed by that and so in a way that those two universes they they have points of connection but they're not necessarily uh, connected all the time mm. thanks <laughs> <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, congratulate for the presentations. I have a question for Ruth, and um, I believe you answered my, my question, <laughs> the last question, but uh, how do you see the relationship between the lesbian struggle and the LGBT movement in Brazil today or in the last years because have these conflicts and these different demands and I read some papers and workers, but it's a gay man vision. Mm -hmm. I have a, a, a specific a lesbian vision about the movement and this struggle in Brazil. So this is my question. Thanks. Uh, I think a lot of the current lesbian struggles are also informed by broader debates within the, the LGBT movement and intersection with feminist movement as well. I would, I would highlight, well, turf wars and uh, the role of uh, transgender people within uh, the lesbian movement. And well, we here in the US and in other countries as well, we see uh, the emergence of lesbian separatist groups that are not welcoming uh, to trans people. And that in Brazil is very much present. Uh, and not necessarily because there are a lot of lesbian separatist groups, but because uh, I think the, les the lesbian movement, at least uh, to the extent that I'm involved in, uh, has highlighted that, well, uh, Trans women are a part of the LGBT movement. Trans women can be a part of the lesbian movement as well. And uh, so that intersection between uh, le the lesbian movement, the transgender movement, the emergence of a, well, as a, as a, of a uh, trans, uh, trans masculine identities within uh, the lesbian movement and that interplay is also, is also interesting. Is, is the thing that I'm, I'm looking, uh, since I work on history, I'm being informed by what's happening now, but also trying to see those dynamics in the past because, uh, well, lesbian identities were, and transgender identities were, were being fused with lesbian identities in the past by medical discourse. So how, how can that inform the way that we do politics today is something that I look for, not only in my research, but also in the way that I conduct my politics. But thanks. Yeah, I think that's it, yeah. <laughs> Thanks all for your presentations, really enjoyable. Um, I have uh, questions for um, Alexandria and Matteo. Um, Alexandria, you didn't invite me to come, but um, <laughs> I'm here non nonetheless. Um, what do women bring to their approach to business that is unique? I mean, I'm getting a sense of your cataloging women's involvement in the industry. But I'm not hearing, certainly in this presentation, what, whether there's a feminist approach, which in its method of organization, which in its um, emphasis on how it you know, raises funds or approach or networks with people makes it unique or not for that matter. I'm, I'm just curious as to whether there is, is a feminist approach to business, um, which, is, which, which, is captured, which, which needs to be captured and, and, and brought out. Also a quick comment, um, Alexandra, in that, have you been in touch with Karen Allen Baxter? Karen is a retired manager of the Rights and Reason Theater here at Brown University. She was manager for decades, um, but in an earlier life uh, was the, um, I'm not quite sure how to put this um, neatly, so I won't. She was the bad person for Bob Marley in that Bob didn't trust a lot of people and didn't believe in credit cards. So his concerts were uh, literally collected a lot of cash and she was the only person he trusted 
with his cash. So it might be useful to speak to her right here at home at Brown um, uh, as to her role in all of this. I, I, we've never mentioned this before, but I think it's worthwhile speaking with Karen. Uh, my, my, quest, uh, my question for Matteo, two really. First of all, Matteo, please let the technician play that clip. <laughs> Let's not leave without hearing it, okay? I mean, it's so important. Don't overlook that. But, but my comment is, is in relation to this notion of, um, of Allende, the second point about Allende telling the people not to sacrifice themselves. And um, you, you presented it as sort of intention with his earlier statement about him sacrificing himself. And I'm wondering whether there's not just a very simple answer to that, that Allende, a student of global political history, is fully conscious of what unarmed people facing military might uh, would do to the, to, to the advanced sections of, of the working class. You know, think about the Paris Commune, Instances where highly mobilized and conscious people faced, however, with uh, a military. Uh, you, you can destroy that advanced force for decades. And I think Allende would have been highly aware of that historical possibility. And in effect, telling people to stand up, which is what I think. I don't, I don't know if, uh, um, if Alexandra wants to make a comment, and then Matthew made Well, I, I can go first. Um, I didn't hear you towards the tail end of that, Dr. Meeks, but um, to answer your question, in a sense, um, depending on who I'm speaking to, the term feminism is a loaded term, right? depending on the generation of the person, they may not necessarily refer to themselves as feminist um, and might not you know, refer to themselves as conducting some sort of feminist business context, but there is a key awareness of partnership and sisterhood amongst women. So to the video, um, Miss Elliott mentions Claudette Kemp, she mentions Judy Moat, she mentions Bridget Anderson and several others um, in our greater conversation. And so she is really, and several others have been very keen on this question of women joining together and ensuring that they, you know, can work together amongst themselves to kind of undo the quote unquote boys club in a sense. Um, but again, I think it's been more so um, a lot of the younger women who I've spoken to in the industry who may have referred to themselves as feminist and um, take hold of that terminology in terms of what that means for their own personal political views, as well as their business and industrial practices as well. And I will be sure to um, reach out to Ms. Baxter. Thank you. Thank you for your question, uh, Professor. Uh, absolutely. I agree with you. I think uh, Allende was very well aware that that he has an, an important position and his word was uh, kind of important to the big population of Chileans. He addresses all the Chilean population in his discourse. He, he knew that and he knew that the army was well prepared, well trained, and there was no, no option to to just uh, fight openly. Um, but I also think that there, there is a generational thing there because uh, younger people who were more Cuban influenced, more, more, more influenced by the guerrilla warfare, for example, uh, like uh, El Movimiento Izquierda Revolucionario de Miguel Enriquez, uh, they choose to fight. Uh, in, in a clandestine way, by like in a very aggressive way, and, and they created a symbol, but of course they didn't succeed at all, right? They, they were rapidly dismantled in kind of a year. What I think is also interesting is when, when, when we see like recent uh, views on Allende's decision, some part of, of the left criticized him for being too institutionalist, right? Uh, 
But I think it's also hard to tell because, yes, the Pinochet dictatorship was brutal. There were like 3,000 people killed and so on. That was much more than Brazil, for example. Brazil dictatorship tortured a lot, but didn't kill that much. But it was less than Argentina, for example. There were like 30,000. So if you put in, into perspective the brutality of, of Pinochet's regime, uh, it looks like Allende also did like the correct thing. If, 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 you, if you compare and, and, and you, it's, it's hard to tell because it was brutal, but what could have happened if he had uh, invited them or asked them to, to join, of course, it, will, it would have been a disaster. So yeah, I think that answer. Right. I believe I'm next. <laughs> Thank you for presenting your phenomenal research. I have a question for Matteo. I was particularly interested in what you said regarding um, how self-sacrifice is a performative act that seeks to convey a message. And immediately, I thought of a, another head of state of comparable skill, um, Getulio Vargas, who also uh, wrote a letter um, before he committed suicide. Um, so my question is, have you done um, a comparative analysis of letters of a comparable scale, me in particular, I'm thinking of Getulio Vargas, um, and found rhetoric that mimics each other in Salvador Allende's and in um, other texts. And related to that, um, is self-sacrifice an effective way of creating a legacy? That's the question that you ask at the end. Was Salvador Allende um, effective in creating a legacy? Thank you so much. Uh, I think those are great questions. Like the first one about Getulio Vargas. Yeah, like Getulio Vargas, I, I think he's suicide from the 50s, so it's a different period in time. But I think there are, there are some similarities. I believe he wrote the letter, like his note of suicide, and he said like he was entering history after this, right? And Allende was very well aware not just in his final speech, but before, that he was, uh, that he could be entering into the history of, of like the world history, the Chilean history, by, by doing what he was doing. Like in the Unidad Popular in the 70s, they were very well aware that this was something that was seen as new at the time. And and, I, and, and Allende, there's a famous anecdote that he says that he has, that he, he, he said to another person, like, tengo carne estatua, like, my, my flesh is, like, made to be made a statue. So it, it's a kind of uh, anecdote, but it tells something. It tells that he was aware uh, that, that there was this kind of... Um, possibility to to get in and, and uh, in, into history and that that's related to his institutional approach to politics and his respect for the big fathers of the nation and all of that um, in the Chilean specific case there's another famous case that is from Presidente Balmaceda at the end of the 19th century he committed suicide uh, in what in which was like the end of a civil war so I think those like there's a story to tell in Latin America that is of course broader than the scope of my dissertation, but we can also uh, ask about that. And of course there's a rhetoric of self-sacrifice, especially from this kind of leaders that decide to do so. So how effective it is, I think, taking into account that self-sacrifice is a performative act it depends a lot of the audience and how the audience is engaged with that or not. And I think the 60s and 70s were particularly a time where this idea of self-sacrifice, which is not exactly committing suicide in, <laughs> or, or whatever, but this idea of self-sacrifice was, was a very clear, was generational, especially to young people. But I think that when military dictatorships started doing what they did and detaining a lot, lots of people and torturing, killing people, going to exile, the idea of self-sacrifice began to disfigure. And 
lose starts losing sense and then it's not the idea of the hero but it's the idea of the victim and we have a whole different uh, frame um, yeah so that's something that what I can say right now but but I think that the effectiveness of self-sacrifice varies a lot of the context thank you is this on? okay uh, my question is for Morgan thank you all for your um talks and I'm sorry if I'm cutting in line for my question. Um, so basically you just you talk about how this relatively large aguada is built with temporal distance between the residential sector um, or the structures that had residents that you know basically the aguada could have supported a lot more people than what you have structures for. Have you thought of any other explanations for this being built earlier? Like is it possible that it was built like as a safety net for an unpredictable climate. Um, you know, a year with less than average rainfall, you would maybe need to have been collecting more um, or have storage for more, um, especially with all of the evaporation and everything. Just, are there any other explanations that you can think of other than it really was supporting a larger population? Um, yeah. So. I think so. The thing that I didn't make very clear was that the other structure that I was talking about that dated later in time was not really a residential structure and the it, and it was like on this this east complex of the site but the west complex of the site where the Iguata was uh, there were resident there were residential most of the residential structures on the site are actually like date to around the same time it's just that all of the fortifications and that weird structure date later um, so in terms of like whether it's not a population issue, I think the interesting thing is, and I didn't talk about this because I was cutting a lot of things out at the last minute for time, is that there are there are two other major water sources like right there. So in the map, like right between the complexes, there is a sea vol, which is like a swamp, and it it contains a lot of water. It probably would have dried up in the like the hottest season, the hottest months of the dry season. But there's also the Bajo, like by the palace, which is a seasonal swamp and also would have dried up. So the Iguata does ensure that there's water available, like, all the time. Um, I guess the thing that isn't clear is, like, why was it positioned there? Because it there there are other places where it could have been positioned to catch a lot of rainwater especially like you know closer to where those other bodies of water were um it just seems like that would be a really easy to defend location so the question that we don't have an answer to is whether like the defensibility of it was actually part of the planning at the very beginning that's that's the mystery i guess Thanks. <clears throat> first, first, uh, excuse my my terrible English, really terrible. Eh? And, and second, my I, I am really impressed with your presentation. Really, they are very stimulating in the intellectual sense. I have a question, a specific question to you, the historian of the Andean region, Mark. No? Matt. Mark, okay. Yeah. This is, uh, my question is, is about, I noticed that you emphasize those roots that connect the, the central Andean region with, with the Napa de la Plata. Mm -hmm. That is the chakra, chakra, capitania de chakra, mm -hmm. with the, with the, the, with the Napa de la Plata, Buenos Aires. Uh, well, there are other routes in this, in this area which are very important, very relevant historically, uh, in, including presently. I will try to explain why. One of them, according to this, the, the studies, probably you know this, those studies, by Clara Lopez, who is in, in Spain, uh, Bolivian, uh, historian, brilliant, well, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Uh, he, he, he made the distinction between two different routes. One route was mentioned in your presentation, that is the route of the silver. 
from uh, Potosí to Arica. The second is the route of the fish between Potosí and Antofagasta, Tocopilla, specifically. And this second route is less relevant in, in economic terms. She was uh, created in order to provide uh, ship food to the water in the mines. But it's very relevant in geopolitical terms because it established the connection between Bolivia, the, the present Bolivia, what later was Bolivia, with the what later was the Fagata Rio, the show the, the piece of, of shoreline that Bolivia lost during the Pacific War. So it's very interesting connection. Have you do you think to emphasize in any moment of your research about this other uh, route? Yeah, so thank you. Um, absolutely super important. There's there's tons of routes that, that crisscross this area. Uh, I would say uh, no, only in the sense that I'm not the best person to work on it. Uh, Francisco Garcia Alvarido, who I, I cite in my presentation, has, has worked a lot in that area. Um, we have the same master's advisor, so we've talked, but he's looking specifically at the Pacific Coast um, and those connections, the, the sort of geopolitical connections to um, Arica and, and, and the um, route of the fish. Um, but it, it, it is a question of um, sort of which road do you focus on and how do you divide them? Because really what you're looking at is a network, right? I, I drew a line, but you're, you're looking at sort of a spider web in actuality. I, I chose the line that I did because the question I'm, I'm particularly interested in is sort of early colonial versus late colonial. Um, and then, of course, obviously, there's early Republican as, as sort of nation states form. And I was really interested in, in late colonial as a, as a transitionary period. So the, the spatial choice that I make was about emphasizing that difference. Um, but yeah, it, it's certainly worth considering. Um, and I appreciate you bringing it up. I think that we are on time. So thank you very much to all of you and all the people who share their interests and time with our researchers panel. Thank you. Thank you.